All right, well, uh, my name's Tom Derenthal. I'm going to be the moderator tonight. And uh, first, I'd like to welcome you. And uh, second, uh, give everyone a chance to introduce themselves. And I think we're going to start with this room. And we're going to go around the table. And Richard, why don't you start? Uh, Richard Hilliard, uh, High Grove Court, Ward 1. Keith Pillsbury, University Terrace, Ward 8. Carol Livingston, uh, Calarco Court, Ward 1. I'm also on the steering committee. Angie Chapel Sokol, North Prospect Street, Ward 8. One. One. <laughs> Jonathan Chapel Sokol. Oh. Uh, Jonathan, where's the carpet? This is carpet. Um, Jonathan Chapel Sokol, Ward 1, and I'm also on the steering committee, and I also live at North Prospect Street. With me. Uh, my, again, my name's Tom Darenthal. I'm in Ward 1 as well. I'm on the steering committee. My name's Ellie House, I'm Ward 8. Uh, Jane Stromberg, the outgoing Ward 8 City Councilor, College Street. Nice to see everybody. And then we're going to go uh, through the, the Zoom uh, participants. And Kathy, you want to start? Kathy Alwell, um, East District School Commissioner, Wards 1 and 8, but I live in Ward 1. And I, 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 excuse me if I pronounce Saja. People. Saja. Yeah. Yeah, hi, my name is Saja, and I'm Ward 8. Uh, Zariah? Hi, Zariah Hightower, um, Board 1 City Councilor on Hildred Drive. Jack? Hey, everyone, this is Jack Canson, the East District City Councilor. I live on College Street in Ward 8. Jean? Jean Hopkins, Ward 1. Cynthia? Hi, everyone. I'm Cynthia Cook. I live on East Avenue in Ward 1. Olivia? She's presenting oh. later. So oh, okay. Laura? She's presenting later. Oh. Aquilas. Aquilas. Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Aquilas Lokosu, and I'm representing Ward 1. Cyril? Cyril Flash, Ward 1. Madeline? She's I'm with DPW presenting for the sidewalk. Okay, and Deborah? You're muted, Deborah. You're, you're, mad, you're muted. Well, uh, did I miss anyone uh, who wants to introduce themselves? All right, hearing none, um, we're going to move forward to speak out. Uh, people online, uh, if you just raise your hand, I can call on you, and I'll keep an eye open for people in the room here. Cynthia? You got your Sorry, I was having trouble with the mute. Um, this, I just wanted to request that when Madeline speaks for DPW, she addresses the uh, pretty egregious safety issues regarding sidewalks in uh, both wards. Um, as um, I think uh, Jonathan and Angie and Carol may recall, uh, there was a meeting uh, two and a half years ago now, at least, when there were 14 people at the NPA meeting and, and seven of them had had serious injuries in the in the past couple of months from tripping on sidewalk issues. So so we'd love for you to speak to that, Madeline, when it's when it's your turn. I know you have limited time, but but um, it's a pretty big problem. So thanks. A anyone else on the Zoom call? All right, we're going to go to the room here then. Richard, you had your hand up? Yeah. Uh, two months ago, Brian Chena was um, on a Zoom call talking about um, various things, and he started to talk about the police, and his he came up with a phrase that I take serious exception to, and I think it's the sort of characteristic of Zoom calls is that people can say things and we move on instead of addressing them. But he said blah, 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 
until the police started killing them, uh, killing people. And I think that, that is such a disgraceful representation from a, uh, an elected official. And I'd just like to rep, uh, represent my formal complaint about that. And I regret that it was accepted. And I regret that I didn't speak out at the time. He's an idiot. OK, thanks, Richard. Uh, Keith. I wanted to thank the uh, volunteers from Ward 8, Ward 1, and the student government for helping us out to run a pretty secure and safe uh, election on a, a town meeting day. We really rely on uh, out of Ward 8 uh, representatives or volunteers to help us uh, do the uh, the work of the uh, of the polling and making sure that everybody gets an opportunity to uh, to vote and uh, have a have a, a private has their privacy and uh, security, etc. So I really want to thank th those who stepped up from Ward One, those who stepped up from Ward Three, and those who st that stepped up and helped us out from the student government. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, Carol, are, are you going to say something about Winterlude? I was. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to ask you if you were. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, so Winterlude was put on by the old East End um, folks again. Um, they've already done it earlier in the season. Um, they happened to hit a Saturday and Sunday right after our most recent snowstorm. Um, so it was it was wonderful. It was the same thing. It was um, Parks and Rec brought lots of uh, winter equipment for for people to try. A lot of kids tried tried out skiing and snowshoeing. Uh, there was a fire um, in a controlled area, uh, and the the. The uh, barn itself is a really wonderful space. So if you see that happening again, I know they plan to do um, something for Kids Day in May. Um, it's a wonderful space, and I would invite all of you to, to try to stop by at some point. Um, I know Zariah did um, a couple weeks ago. So please please come when you have the opportunity um, just to see what that's about. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, are there any other announcements or speak out? Oh, Jonathan. I, I actually have two. I've got one for right. Glenn McRae, and then I've got I've got to rant myself. Um, so this is a <clears throat> this is from Glenn McRae, who could not be here tonight, but he sent this to be read into the minutes. After the last NPA discussion on future UVM plans for housing and the proposed changes to the, the Trinity campus, there was an inquiry as to whether UVM could be held to an agreement not to increase enrollment without having a corresponding number of new housing units to accommodate them. As it turns out, the city of Berkeley has done, this, done exactly this with UC Berkeley, and it was recently upheld by a, the California Supreme Court. Uh, and he puts a reference in, and we can put this in the minutes. Okay. <coughs> so it is wor worth considering whether this should be a path taken by the city in negotiating with UVM. Students represent great assets and opportunities to the city, but having the burden of housing them in neighborhoods means less available housing for everyone, including those students who graduate and want to stay in Burlington, but can't because there's no affordable housing and they don't want to live like students, as it were. We have seen how fragile a housing situation is recently with the evictions happening in Winooski. We don't have any surplus capacity. While UVM seeks to compete with other universities whose students get to live off campus, maybe they need to consider different comparables and change their branding. Creating a campus life that attracts students to be part of a vibrant and exciting campus, living in quality and affordable quarters with local local board food. This doesn't seem to be too much of a stretch goal, he writes. And in the in the email he sent to me, he suggested that maybe the steering committee would like to invite the organization from Berkeley to come to one of our meetings and tell us what they did. That, that's a great idea. And I think that could be very interesting. Um, and I'd like to just do a, uh, just make a quick statement. And I hope nobody takes umbrage about this because it's not, there's nothing personal in this. But I have three, I have three brief, brief comments about last week's election. The first is please make sure you've collected all your signs. Even today I will walk to town and I found signs on the ground. So um, everything, else about, everything else about the campaign I really appreciate. I think everybody did a wonderful job and it was very respectful. I really. Thank you. Thank you for all that. But the signs are still there. 
Second, uh, I find voter turnout for this selection quite disturbing. I'm disturbed because Burlington prides itself on its activism, civic involvement, and community engagement. Overall turnouts across the city, based on the school budget vote, was just under 30%. The wards one and eight were much worse. Uh, in Ward 8, the winner got fewer than 1 in 10 registered votes to vote for her. This isn't about you, Allie. Oh, this no, is none the, This is about voting. It's you are, you are preaching to the choir. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so fewer than 1 in 10. So we've got a room with 10, 9 or 10 people in it. You might have gotten one of these votes. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's, a, it's incredible. Uh, and, and in Ward 1, it wasn't really much better. It was 1 in 7. Voted, 1 in 7 registered voters voted for the winner. I do not believe this is the fault of the candidates, and I am convinced it isn't about it being too hard to vote. I, I believe in mail-in voting. I believe in all resident voting. But neither of these things really address the real problems. I don't, think, I don't think that's what the problem is. Comparing with previous elections is difficult because each is unique in some way. National primaries, mayoral elections, unopposed candidates, it's complicated. Perhaps we should form a committee or hire a consultant to understand the real problem and identify solutions. This is Burlington, after all. Final observation is that voter turnout this year and in the past strongly correlates with home ownership. Strongly correlates. In fact, if you make a plot of votes cast in each ward against the number of single family units uh, being single family homes and condos, you get a nearly perfect relationship. Really perfect. And I won't go to the weeds. I can put the charts in the minutes. You can look at them. But the relationship is quite compelling. Of course, it's a correlation. It's not causal, but it's, but it's, but it's compelling. The other very interesting thing is that if you look at voter turnout by ward compared to the number of rental units, there's an inverse proportion. So the more rental units there is, there are in a ward, the fewer voters come out. The wards with more rental units actually have smaller voter turnout. The correlation is not as good, but it's still disturbing. Um, I hope that the city council and the city can give some thought to the poor engagement that we have in our elections. We, we have to do better. The city has to do better. Thank you. That's my way. Uh, last call for speak out. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, so I, I know I haven't met all of you in person yet, um, but my name's Allie, and I was just elected um, for Wardy City Council. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to let you all know that um, I'm, like, looking forward to, like, you know, being representative for this district, to learning, having dialogue, and, and also supporting students and long-term residents alike. Okay. Um, that brings us to city council updates. And uh, as an intro to that, I, first I want to congratulate Ali and Zariah <laughs> for being reelected, being reelected. And uh, Jack, you'll have a chance, I guess, next year? Yeah. No, you're you're smiling, but you're not uh, saying yes. <laughs> when's your turn? When is, how long's your term go, Jack? I'm not going to decide now, but <laughs> my term my term is up next year. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I, I was just saying that your time will come to be reelected next year. Um, and on the city council updates, we have three subjects that we were hoping to hear about. And one is public safety, the second is housing, and the third is energy efficiency. And so, councilors, you can take it away. Uh, um, who, would like, who would like to speak first? I, sorry guys, I can't tell if you're trying to hop in, but I'm happy to like kick it off with public safety because that's the most fresh in my mind since I had a committee meeting yesterday, if that's okay. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Um, so um, for the last few Tuesdays, with the exception of town meeting day, um, we as a committee, a public safety committee of the city council have been meeting um, every Tuesday to go through the CNA report and look at the recommendations, look at what the BPD and PP, BPOA kind of say about a lot of the recommendations that are made and then what kind of consensus we can come to within a committee. Um, and within a working group um, around those things and, and trying to rank and prioritize which recommendations we wanna kind of implement and, and then which ones we wanna look into a little bit further um, and work on. And so we've been, we've been categorizing things in terms of like 
you know, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and then also our comments as a committee. So we're going through every single one of those recommendations and we've gotten through, we went through section one, section two, and we just completed section three yesterday. Um, we're gonna continue sections four, five, and six, which are shorter. Um, and then those previous sections and the in the following Tuesdays to come. So next week we're having a meeting. Um, the following, you know, for the rest of the my Tuesdays on council, I'll be on this committee and and having these meetings. And then um, this committee is going to continue working through this until it is done. It should be done soon. That is, you know, I, I uh, Councillor Paul um, actually stated stated the timeline yesterday, and it looks like things are going to somewhat conclude soon on that front, and we'll be able to move forward in terms of what things can be can be implemented um, for the betterment of our city in terms of um, the police department and how things are functioning within the department, um, and then um, just as a community too. And uh, we we talked about a bunch of different things. These are public meetings. You're more than welcome to look at them. They are only available on board docs right now. They aren't on YouTube. We're actually trying to work that out like in live time as a committee, um, so, but they are available on board docs. Um, but we were talking about a lot of different things in terms of having a public information officer, um, how we can kind of really open up the dialogue between the community and the police department. Of course, a lot of other things are um, around the union contract and things like that. So it does make things a little bit more complex but important and, and something we are we're just trying to appropriately categorize so that's the main update from me in terms of where we are in that there is a lot of progress being done and i know zariah can definitely speak to that too but um yeah i'm really proud of the work we're doing in that committee and i'm excited to to finish to finish that project because it is it is quite large and, and quite important so thank you and jane maybe if i can just add some background yeah. for folks who don't know Right, so the CNA report had about, I think, 200 recommendations. I'm creating the exact number now. And it's the Public Safety Committee, and we also invited um, kind of a working group to help us work through them, which includes um, the Church Street Marketplace, sorry, one representative from the Church Street Marketplace, Food Not Bombs, um, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, one member of the BPOA, Oren, who's been representing them, and then generally Taisha and John. So Taisha from REIB and John Murad from the um, BPD tend to join us for those. I don't know if I'm missing someone. I think that's it. So, and I apologize for interrupting, but I just want to ask the people in the room if you can uh, uh, move your microphones when you're not speaking. Um, it's very difficult for me to hear uh, people in the room. Ironically, it's very easy for me to hear you, Zariah, but uh, um, there's just minor noises like uh, typing on a keyboard or moving papers uh, have a big effect on the microphones. So it was, it was very hard to hear the last presentation, and I, I really want to hear what you counselors have to say. So um, if there's any quick fixes, I just appreciate it, and sorry for the interruption. Thanks, Cindy. I actually, I actually was going to say something that I forgot. You're right. It's very hard for people out there to hear if there's anything going on. So it's better if there aren't any side conversations and use the microphone. Thank you, Cindy. Sorry, I'm or Jack. Um, yeah. I'll jump in on housing, which um, I know I'm supposed to limit it to one thing on housing, but maybe I'll talk about a few things on housing because I can't resist, um, which is one on the speak out, I think on UVM. I don't know how much we've talked about this as an NPA, but um, I know they came and presented last time, but I was very disappointed with the presentation that they gave the council which very much had a tone of UVM is already such a great neighbor. You can't expect anything else from us because we're already doing so well. Um, I didn't quite get that. It was also different representatives. Um, I think it's the folks who show up at the NPA are usually the folks that we work with directly in there. Great. Um, but, oh goodness, I'm about to run out of battery. Um, but um, I think that yeah, I think having the representatives from Berkeley would be great to hear about how that went. And then I think generally, I think the council, and I'm not gonna say everyone, but I think the majority of the council is pretty committed to using Trinity campus um, as an opportunity to 
create an agreement with UBM that has some teeth on how many students they're housing versus how many they're not housing. Um, so I don't know what that looks like yet. Obviously, the council isn't directly in the negotiation rooms. That tends to be the mayor's office, but we definitely have the, as we often usually only do, the veto power on any agreement. So, um, and of course, on any of the final zoning changes that UBM wants, um, which I think means, and I've got a meeting with the mayor tomorrow, but I'll definitely push him on this, which I think means that we can ask for um, something that really is enforceable, whereas right now we just have a soft agreement. Um, the other things on housing um, that I want to talk about is, I don't know if folks know, I don't remember, I think we talked about this as well last time, maybe it was even as part of a debate, I don't remember, but I feel like this came up in NPA, um, how the ARPA funds are being used around housing, because housing was the number one priority. It came out of the citywide survey um, that CEDO did, which is one of the best surveys we've ever done in terms of how many folks responded to it, um, which is great that the city finally got that much input. Um, it also shows that people are excited to talk about how to spend money. Um, and what came out of that is that the city is setting aside, I think, roughly $5 million for housing. And a lot of that has already been used or has already been allocated towards houselessness and specifically short-term housing. And I think one of the things that um, I guess is kind of lacking in the proposal is how to, any long-term proposals to help kind of long-term housing and affordability, um, which with you know the amount of money that we are talking about now, which is kind of 15 million that's left to be used that we say is you know, up to the discretion within the limits of how that funding can be used. Um, but I think that's one of, I guess, one of the points of feedback that we're giving staff in terms of something we'd like to see. And maybe I'll pause there. I do have one more housing thing, which is just to say just cause eviction, I won't pause, I lied. Um, it's just cause eviction, did make it through the house and is now hopefully gonna go to the Senate um, where I don't think it'll have any trouble passing. Um, and then the only other thing would be the um the governor who could potentially veto it but that would be a bummer sorry can i ask just a real quick question about the just cause eviction thing i thought that that the house made some changes to what had been submitted are those in your opinion substantial or do they really change much um, there was one change which would have been extremely substantial um, in terms of n not or saying that small landlords weren't included, which would have been almost unenforceable for the city just in terms of the amount of LLCs that we have that we just don't have the team to go through and try to figure out who owns all those LLCs. So the city attorney's office um, and Sarah Carpenter did a really good job of going back and convincing the house that that wasn't going to work. And so I think the most substantial change is that they, and this isn't how they talked about it in committee, so I don't know why this was the final change, but that the moving costs, so one of the things was you can evict for some no cause reasons, such as substantial renovations, which I think is defined as 50% of the value of the home. Um, but then we said, but then you have to provide moving costs. And the house changed that to be that the maximum moving cost would be the cost of one month's rent, which isn't what we're envisioning. We're thinking $1,000, because I think that's similar to what Champlain Housing Trust does. Um, so that's, that's one change. But generally, it went through pretty close to what we drafted. And I feel, I feel good. That's definitely, I'm fine with how it is, even if it is that that with that one small change and there were a few other things but those aren't substantive okay thanks uh jack sure i can go now so i had offered to speak about uh a policy around regulating new development around minimum parking but i think i was asked to put it in the context of other climate policy and i think that it's as much housing as it is climate, um, but I can start there, which is, you know, in the context of the climate crisis, transportation is our biggest source of emissions and it's 
<clears throat> it's the area of society that we need to change the most dramatically. And that's especially true here in Vermont. We're super car dependent in Vermont, even in Burlington, where there are alternatives, ways of getting around and it's more walkable. Um, we still are, are heavily car dependent in Burlington. And a lot of that has to do with policy and infrastructure. One of the policies that has created and reinforced car culture in Burlington is minimum parking requirements, which were put into place, um, I think in the 60s originally, they've been changed over time and expanded. Um, but it's the requirement that any new construction builds a certain amount of parking spaces. And the logic at the time was basically that everyone drives and having a car is part of the American way of life. So if you're building a building, you have to provide parking for everyone to get to and from that building. That was the original logic. And it was somewhat self-fulfilling prophecy it, from the standpoint of it, it actually really encouraged people to drive and created that infrastructure. And it took that very expensive cost of building parking and put it into housing and basically forced everyone to pay um, for it, whether they wanted it or not, and provided them that parking. So it was a huge economic and infrastructural incentive for people to, to continue to you know, rely on cars in Burlington. We made a, ch a big change to that policy in 2020 where we eliminated any requirements to build parking for the whole downtown core and then anywhere where there's transit, where there's bus routes. So along the major corridors in Burlington, new develop wouldn't, would no longer be required to build parking. And that was a change we adopted in fall of 2020. Um, I've always been a firm, but, and, and we also replaced those requirements with sustainable transportation requirements. So developers still have to take accountability for the transportation impact of their, de that, the, that their development is going to have. But rather than just putting that only into car infrastructure, we required them to support other modes of transportation for, for their tenants or for employees. Um, so we added in those requirements. I've always firmly believed that this policy should be citywide. And last September, I think I introduced an expansion of that ordinance that would get rid of these requirements citywide and add in these sustainable transportation requirements. That's been moving through committees. Raya and I are on the ordinance committee. We've been working through that policy and we're about to bring it back to the full council. So if anyone's interested, we have our ordinance meeting tomorrow at five. This is the only item I think, well, maybe one other item, but we're going to focus on this policy. It's probably our last time looking at it and then it should go to the full city council for the last meeting in March. It's also really important for housing because it significantly lowers the cost of building new housing in Burlington. Um, to get rid of this requirement. And yeah, I guess, I don't know if I'm over time, but I'll try to just quickly zoom out, looking at the climate crisis, what we're trying to do. Transportation is huge. The other major source of emissions in Burlington and in Vermont is buildings, heating buildings. Um, so the rental weatherization is a big piece of that, and that's underway. That's being enforced now. The the most inefficient rental units in Burlington are being weatherized this year. And it'll in the next three over the next three years, it'll work its way down. And we're going to weatherize um, a huge number of, of units. All the ones that need it essentially in Burlington are going to be weatherized in the next few years, which is huge. Only a few cities in the country have done that. Um, but more broadly, we need to move all of the, you know, aside from energy efficiency in buildings, we also have to move all these buildings off of fossil fuels. We've already adopted strong requirements for new construction to heat renewably um, without fossil fuels. But this charter change that we approved last year was, would allow the city to actually regulate existing buildings and start to move those off of fossil fuels. We have really strong incentives in place already to make people make the switch, but we also are gonna need policy as well. So that charter change has also been working its way through the legislature. 
it's moving. I can't remember exactly where it is, but it is on course. It hasn't been amended. It's moving. Um, we'll see what the governor does, if he supports it or not. But I've already been talking with um, the head of Burlington Electric Department about, you know, if we do get that authority from the legislature and the charter change gets through, um, we can move pretty quickly on some policies on that front. So I'll stop there, but those are a few of the things around the climate crisis. All right, thanks, Jared. Uh, do we have questions for city council? People on Zoom, questions? Uh, Carol. Hi, I just, I'll speak to that one. Um, just really cons wondering, Jack, I know you've dealt with this to some degree, but just the impact that the parking um, ordinance has on, on folks who have lower income who um, still do have cars or still do need parking. I mean, how has that been accommodated in your plans? I mean, I'm just wondering if that's been a factor that you've been considering. Yes, yeah, so the parking minimum requirements, it's not preventing we do have parking maximums we're not amending those really other than just small sort of technical changes we're not really changing the maximum parking allowed for new development we're just eliminating the minimum so we're not it's not like we're preventing developers from building parking they still have that choice but what and they're still going to build the parking that they think they need to make the project work so if they have units regardless of what income level maybe they have a mixture of market and affordable they're going to still build the parking that they think they need to fill those both affordable and more expensive units and, and find tenants that are going to live there so that's really not going to change but what we're what we're stopping doing is forcing them to build more than they think they need which is currently what we do and it's created a situation where we have tons of excess parking throughout the city that's private that, that, you know, that can't really be used. I think part of what we're doing is to actually share that existing parking because there's so much extra existing parking. We're making it easier now to actually open that up and, and allow it to be used across different developments. So, yeah, and then, and then the other thing is we're actually unbundling the, the cost of um, a parking spot from rent. And so right now, developers will basically just charge more for rent in order to recoup what they spent to build the parking. But a lot of tenants, especially lower income tenants, don't have a car or can't afford a car, yet they're forced to pay for parking they don't use. Now we're forcing developers to actually break that cost out. So only the only someone using a spot would actually do it but the overall cost of rent and housing is going to go down now because it's going to cost less to build and you're not going to you're only paying for the unit not for the parking space so i think this should be really good from an equity perspective and making it more affordable for people who live in burlington okay. and it's also we're also forcing them to provide <clears throat> transit passes for tenants and uh, subsidies for car share to, to, for people to use car share and bike share services as well. The developers are going to have to provide that for um, tenants and employees of the building. All right. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Zariah, do you have your hand up? I do. Sorry. I just have one more quick comment, okay. which I think I, if I have time, because I want to do more of, so I think around the just so folks know, because I think the mayor may veto the short-term rental ordinance um, in the coming week or so. Um, and I just want to make this comment because I saw Jonathan's face on the video camera, which I think is that some of the votes on the short-term rentals were 6-6, six, six, um, which was fairly along partisan lines with Joan and I switching and me voting with the Democrats and independents and her with the progressives. But I just want, regardless of like where we end up on the short term rentals, I just want to emphasize how far we've come like on agreement. I think like the policy space that we're in right now is pretty narrow in terms of like where we could have ended up and where we've landed. So I think right now there's some disagreement on how to like do the final pieces of it. But 
like by and large, we've eliminated a lot of the other options, just such as, you know, like allowing folks who don't live in Burlington um, to have short term rentals unless they truly are compensating it with some kind of very low income housing. So um, I just want to say that for like, however, this is going to be portrayed, I think that we're actually in a very like we're largely agree on almost all the policy issues. And I think there's a few more kind of changes that we're debating. And I don't know how that what's going to happen with that. But I wanted to make sure folks knew that. OK, thanks. Um, oh. I, this is probably not a question, it's a comment. We live in, in the East District, we're around the hill, and uh, or the side hill. And many of our constituents in Ward 8 are uh, student age uh, population. And if you go on my street, you have, you have parking, you have parking uh, driveways. That if there's four in the, in the house, there's four cars. If there's seven in the house, there's seven cars in the parking. So when you talk about car culture, it, there, I think one of the things that you ought to be talking to the university about is maybe students shouldn't need to bring their cars to Burlington if we're going to be a biking and walking place. You have a lot of cars on these small streets that are taking up a lot of space. And I think that's the one, that's one comment I have. Secondly, I have a hundred year old house and I've done everything I can for efficiency. When Burlington Electric said we should have solar panels on our houses, I went out and did it. A couple years ago, I was told by the current director it was a stupid investment. And now you're telling me I need to go out and figure out how I can get a heat pump for my house. I don't know if I could do that in a 100-year-old house. So I think we need to think about the housing in the East District, which is probably not the same as in other districts. And the population is different. And let's see if we can think about solving some of the issues in our own area and not the whole city. Thank you. OK. Is there is there time for me to respond, or are we over? We're sort of over, but I, if you're brief, you can go. <laughs> OK, I'll go quick, which is just I can't respond to everything that Keith said. But I, I think quickly, the UVM component of the transportation thing is huge. That's a lot of what we're going to talk about tomorrow, because UVM has agreements with the city that are part of this ordinance that we're amending around how they deal with transportation. And it is highly regulated. And I agree that they're not doing enough. If you look at their own data, they made a ton of progress on reducing car use among employees and students between like 2000 and 2010. But really, since 2010, they've made really very little, if any, progress on, on reducing that. So I think we need to be stronger with how we regulate um, their transportation impacts. And I, I agree, they can, they can do a whole lot more there. OK, thanks, Jack. Um, Tom, can I just have oh, one? Richard, I forgot. Go ahead. Uh, very, very quickly, but uh, I don't know where the city council is as far as redistricting is concerned, but as I was the uh, Ward 1 rep, I would just like to say to Ali and to Jane and to Zariah and Jack that the presentation that was led by Leah Tahoon at the uh, city council meeting in January did not reflect the um, discussions that the uh, committee that was uh, appointed, uh, discussed in the six or seven meetings that we had. So just just to the city councillors, if you're interested in what we actually discussed rather than what Leah Tahoon would like, uh, I'd be glad to uh, help you if you want to give me a call or email me. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Um, I just want to say, uh, Ali, you, you know, we're not firing line here, but uh, we're you can see that it's it's a robust conversation. Sure. So uh, we're looking forward to you participating in that. Yeah. Uh, all right. So next is uh, school board commissioners. <coughs> and we have new commissioners. Kathy, do you want to introduce our new commissioners? You're on mute. First, 
Sasha, I can't see who's on, but I, I, I heard them earlier. So, Sasha? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> okay, there you are. This is Sasha Amagali, and she is a senior, is it, at UVM or a junior? You could say senior because I'm graduating at the end of this year, so I guess senior, junior. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So but maybe you want to introduce yourself and tell everyone about you. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, again, hi, everybody. My name is Saja Amagali, and I'm technically junior at the University of Vermont, studying biology and health and society. I graduated from Burlington High School. Um, not a while ago, I think during the pandemic in 2020, I think. Yeah. And I live in uh, Ward 8, where the school, I live on campus. And yeah, I went to Burlington High School. I graduated from Burlington High School. My family live in Vermont. I'm from Vermont. Um, not originally from Vermont. Uh, my family is originally from Iraq. We immigrated here in 2017, um, five years ago. And we settled in Vermont. Burlington was the first place we settled in. And recently I became a US citizen, so not a while ago. And now, and, <laughs> yeah, that was very exciting. And my family too did. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else you want me to say. Feel free to ask me questions or anything. I probably won't know much, but I definitely will get back to you. Okay. Um, you gonna continue, Kathy? Yes. And next is Achilles, or I'm, I hope I'm yeah, pronouncing Achilles. this, Lakoto. Uh, it's pronounced Achilles Lakosu. Lakosu, okay, sorry. That's fine. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Achilles. Um, I am a senior out of SUNY Plattsburgh, across the lake. I am a psychology major. Um, I have decided to join uh, Claire Reese out. Uh, I've known her for a while now and uh, good friends with her uh, family. And so I'm, I just recently got into UVM graduate school for um, clinical mental health counseling and also uh, with a dual, dual major. So I just thought it'd be uh, a good idea to get back involved with the community while I'll be home and getting back involved with uh, helping with plans taking place with the new school and making sure um, I can express my opinions to the school board and the, and the town. And I'm just looking forward to getting started and meeting everyone else. Thank you. And I would just like to add that we from the school board are very happy to have your voices on our school board. So we're looking forward to working with both of you and welcome. Okay. Uh, Kathy, are you going to say something about the uh, new high school? I am. I am, but I just wanted to welcome them. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so as far as the high school goes, we have gotten back the, the first best estimate, and that is truly an estimate somewhere between 161 million and 207 million. The 161 million is based on a building size of 273,040 square feet and the 207 million is based on a building size of 315,850 square feet. So this is a cost range. Nothing is set in stone and they haven't finished the drawings and and it hasn't gone through the critical phase of people looking at these drawings and deciding what it is they need and don't need. But we had asked to have at least the beginning of it so we knew what we, if we are going out to start fundraising because we don't feel like this should be held on the backs of only the taxpayers, that we actually 
are planning to do fundraising. We're also planning, and I think it has already started to talk to the federal and state about monies they will put towards these two buildings. I mean, it's one building, but it's the equivalent of a tech center and a high school. So that's where it is. I know there were some questioning about why we let it be known on election day. We did not get this. It was actually not supposed to be back to us until this week. And it came back early, the cost estimate. And so we put it out as soon as we got it. It was probably not exactly the best time to do that <laughs> since most people had voted by the time the PR came out on it. So. We hope that people will understand that there are, there are now the next steps timeline is out there that by March 2nd, <coughs> the, that was the estimate. But then on March 18th, there's a draft conceptual design option completed. March 28th would be the final conceptual design option and project cost estimates should be completed. April 5th, present the, cons the conceptual design um, op options and project cost estimates to the school board. April 12th, public forum presents conceptual de design op options. April 21st, the school board chooses a conceptual design for next phase of design. Summer 23, the construction begins and summer 25, we hope is the grand opening of the school. So we know it's a very tight timeline, but having kids down at Macy's is not always the best option for schooling. And so we're trying to push this to get it done as fast as possible. So I know you may, some of you may have questions and please fire away if I can answer, I will, but. Do we have questions here in the, the room? Or anyone on Zoom, Jack? Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Um, do you know, is the design gonna be net zero? They are going to try to get it as close to net zero as they can, because that has been brought up to them to the architects in in the discussion about this that it that they try net zero is not always the cheapest model and that 200 million where you know so it's all what can we do for the cost and what will the taxpayers support so yes it is it is something we've actually told them that we would like it to be as close to net zero as possible. Thanks, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Jonathan. Kathy, um, <clears throat> this, this looks like the, the cost is like 600 odd dollars per square foot. That's just, you know, taking the two numbers and dividing them. That's just what? That's just taking the two numbers and dividing them. It's not like there's any right. work going into it. But that's, that's a pretty high number for new construction. Is that because tech center has special, there's special things about a tech center that require more, more expensive space or something like that. What's driving the high cost per square foot of the space? I, I'm, I have to say, we found this out and on Tuesday, there wasn't, I, I don't actually know what the cost per square foot is an average cost, but I have heard, and they have also said this, that they don't know right now what the cost of all the um, building supplies are going to be. It's an estimate because they keep going up every month. I mean, anybody who's built anything in the last two years knows, first of all, it's very hard to get the building supplies. And secondly, it is often that the price just continually goes up. I hope that will change now that COVID 
is calming down, but I think they're trying to give us a price that they think we can do it within. If I, I, and, and it may change by the time they finish their drawings and it get back to us what once they, we've decided what the drawing, what the architectural drawings are going to be and what the building is supposed to look like, then we have a better estimate of what this is going to cost. And then also you start having to cut back on certain things because we just can't afford it all, always. And I mean, at least that's exactly what happened with the 70 million to renovate the high school. I know by the end of it, I, you know, it was like, God, all, all your kind of dreams of what you could have put out there just got squelched because it was so expensive that we couldn't, we had 70 million, we knew that. And that's all we could spend. And it really didn't go very far. So. Sarcher? Yeah, I have a question. I might have missed it, but uh, how many companies submitted a proposal? Is this like uh, from one company or like different companies? And is still the vetting open or? Uh, no, so we, we had different architectural firms come to us with, and we chose one. Well, it's not one, it's three, actually it's three architectural firms together are working on this project. And they then are giving us, this is not where you can put out a bid and you get the best bid. You can do that for the supplies you're using, but you, you know, they're gonna give us a, a drawing of this building and we decide, do we go with it or not? And then we start going back and forth about what we can afford in it, what we can't. So it's, this is what they estimate the cost of the building would be right now from the, there's been groups of people looking at the school, staff members, teachers, students, parents and community members have all given input into what they would like to see. And so that's kind of on those views, that's what we're getting this estimate at. And it will probably change. You'll have, you will see as it goes. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. <laughs> sure. Right. Kathy, uh, thank you very much. We're gonna have to move uh, on to the next item. Uh, and that is a, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's how can the NPA facilitate stronger connections between residents and city councilors? And I think Jonathan's going to introduce the subject for us and um, and then we can figure out what to do. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'll, I'll try to be very quick. quick. Um, my rant at the beginning is just a piece of this, but it's part of it. We have, uh, we have what we think of as a very active community. We don't see, they seem to be engaged in a lot but we feel like there's, there's connections that just aren't being made. Um, and we like to think, I mean, you look at the NPA and there's, um, how many people are here tonight? 16, 17, um, a pretty small number. It looks kind of like voter turnout. We would like the NPA to do better at making connections between the community and their elected officials. And, and, I, and I think the whole goal of this was to ask about, ask our city councilors what their ideas are to do this. It's just it's a startup conversation. I, you know, my brainstorm this morning was um, we have money, you give us money, uh, we can do bag, you know bagels with the city councilor every week. The, you know, we the the money you give the NPA could conceivably be spent on some kind of thing, some kind of thing like that. That's just a thing. But we're wondering kind of what it is that you think would make it easier for you to connect with the community and how the NPA may be a part of that. So I don't know who wants to start talking. I'm happy to start, um, which is I think that for me, I don't know how much of a drive that I am. I don't know how many people want to talk to me. I'm not sure bagels with the city council are gonna draw more than we have here. But I do think um, 
I also feel like there's, at least in Ward 1, and I imagine Ward 8 is much the same, is there's just so many different groupings of people. Um, there's like very distinct neighborhoods. And I wish that we, I mean, especially, you know, now with it being in the Fisher Conference Room or before it being in UVM, um, I, I wish that we had more of a community feel at just the NPA meeting. So I think even if we had, which I know is hard to do, but if we had more, and I guess I'm thinking about the survey that we just did where, you know, like we asked people how to spend money and that was like the number one kind of survey that we've ever done. So I feel like there's something about like having the community food feel, the potlucky something event style, as well as having folks have some kind of, I know that at some point I was, the NPA was considering a resolution which I think was one of the first times when I met Jack actually, because like we both came out for that meeting admittedly to be like, we don't want this resolution. But like, I think it's just having a little bit more space to make decisions as a community and give feedback to the city council. Um, I think those are, and that's not succinct ideas, but I think that those are two things that help get different kinds of people excited about coming. How come we're, Is someone in the room talking or? No, we're good. Go ahead. We just Go ahead. the screen for a minute. Oh, okay. Yeah, I agree with what, a lot of what Zariah said. I mean, we've, we've talked about this before, but the Old North End, you know, the community dinners that they would do before their NPAs were, were super well attended and a, a lot, and I, I had been to those even before I got really deeply involved with Burlington politics, I had just been invited to, to go to those community dinners. And a lot of people leave after the dinner or would. This is, you know, pre-COVID. I don't know if they've even started it back up or not. But um, most of the people would leave after the dinner and wouldn't really stick around for the formal NPA component of it. So that's a whole other conversation, I guess, of how do we, how can we, you know, address that or foster that. But the fact that so many people come out for the dinner and have those conversations with city councilors and with each other often about these issues is key. So I think creating space for just more conversation in a little bit more of a casual format than this um, could be really helpful, just mingling, free food. Um, so I think these like the Winter Ludes events are a great example of just having different types of events and especially these kid friendly types of, event, of events. I've had a great time going to some of those things at Shemanska Park and just kind of chatting with, with neighbors and stuff. And you end up talking about city stuff just as part of the conversation usually anyway. So I think that's a, that's a component of it for sure. And sorry, I'm gonna cut. And I think that's one other thing is We've had really great events at Schmansville Park, and I wonder if there's other places in Ward 1 and 8 that would be conducive to that kind of thing so that we can spread it to other neighborhoods a little bit. I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I was also going to say, like, maybe have it like intermission style with the dinner so people don't necessarily leave and keep it like sandwiched in the middle. Um, I've been to things that where that was kind of the format. It was very effective. Um, and it's also a nice break. Like you, you can kind of get up, stretch your legs, talk to folks across the room. Um, and then I also was just thinking like UVM is such a huge entity. It's also I, I think there's a divide. I mean, we're not seeing a lot of UVM students here tonight, and maybe it makes sense to host these like in the Davis Center or even have like a separate monthly meeting that takes place at, on the campus. So um, the East District counselors can can meet on campus too to, to have, you know, get feedback and, and stuff from, from folks there because sometimes it's hard to make everyone make this time. Um, and I think we've proven that in some ways, um, for better or for worse. Um, so I think that that's 
another big thing, I think. I mean, (laughs) you might have a better insight on that. Yeah, and I wonder, too, like, sort of uh, about the UVM piece. I know that they're, like, I, I, you know, I've heard from a lot of of folks, there's there's kind of, like, mixed feelings about, um, you know, potentially, like, ways that, like, UVM students might treat neighborhoods and stuff. But I, I think that the NPA can really be, a place like to have those discussions and kind of come together in this like you know neighborly way and I guess um I mean I I don't know like how many of you are are aware but I'm I'm studying social work I'm a social worker um and so what what comes to my mind when I when I think about this meetings or I think about low turnouts are like barriers you know like Soraya had mentioned that there are some like pretty distinct neighborhoods within um wards one and wards eight and and I would also like echo that and say that 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 I, I that's something I've noticed as well um and I think um but it, but you know thinking about these barriers it's like is it a, a lack of just like awareness that these NPAs exist um I know it's something that I wasn't aware of for a long time at UVM um is it a matter of like transportation for folks with mobility issues or folks up on campus I know like you know the Davis Center is a pretty convenient location for a lot of students so mm-hmm. potentially like having something there or even a separate meeting might help um, for some UVM folks to come to the table. Um, and is it, you know, like, is it, I know, um, I, I mean, I can imagine for some students, it might feel a little bit like in, intimidating, like they don't know a, a, a ton about like what an MPA is and like, is it, you know, a, a place that, you know, I can go to. And so I, I wonder about maybe just bringing some more like information about what an NPA is. Um, to some of these more like distinct like, groups. Cindy, you, you have your hand up? I do indeed, yeah. Um, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with the sentiment about um, adding some more community feel to, to these um, uh, meetings and food is a, is a great way to do that. Uh, we did that uh, some at the hospital back when we had meetings there um, I would love to get out of an institutional setting and into something more, um, you know, more community feeling. And we spent a lot of time on this, what, three or four years ago, Richard, maybe something like that, uh, looking around asking UVM, what do you got? You got to have something for us. Seems like 24 yeah. years. Yeah. And <laughs> they, they came back with, we got nothing for you. Um, we, you know, we, we looked at, you know, you know, what about the Davis Center? What about Waterman? And they just uh, didn't have something. And I don't know if that's necessarily bad because what would be really great is if, if we found a place that was part of the community um, and less part of uh, uh, UVM or city government, but more just, you know, um, something with a little bit more soul to it, for, for lack of a better word. Um, and. We came up empty a few years ago. Maybe things have shifted. I hope they have because, um, you know, frankly, looking at this from a Zoom perspective, I'm seeing a very um, U-shaped structure of of tables, and it's not a very welcoming kind of a feel to it. Um, And that's, I know there are all kinds of factors here, and I'm not ascribing any um, negativity to anybody. I'm just saying, we can do better. We can come a lot closer to the old North Ends, uh, big meals with 150 people at them. And so uh, I would love to continue this conversation because um, if the NPA is, is anything, it should be about community. So um, let's keep the conversation going and see what we can come up with. That sounds good. Uh, Kathy, you have your hand up? Well, I was just thinking about like the Friends Meeting House, but I don't think they could hold a hundred and something people. But I, they have a big room in the back that's very nice. And and then also, what about the the old um, Jewish um, synagogue? Synagogue down on on Archibald. Archibald. <laughs> It's. I, I thought they were trying to sell it, or it was empty at least. It's, it's not Ward One, Kathy. Oh. Okay. 
Can I say something? Yeah. Um, so I wasn't being facetious when I said to Cindy, it seems like 24 years, because I have been involved in this for about 24 years. We have had meetings at, obviously, Waterman for a long, long time. So the first meeting I went to was at Trinity College when it was still Trinity College. So that dates it a little bit. So, um, they were w well attended. Then um, we have had local meetings up Macaulay Square. Uh, we had one there which was quite well attended. In the summer, we've had meetings at uh, the barn at Schmanska, uh, which is a great place to go until it got condemned. Um, but hopefully the remediation means that we could hold community meetings. Uh, and I, th the, the, the notion that we should go around the communities, I think, is fabulous. I'm not a big fan of food uh, as, as a draw, but it's very, very effective. Um, and I think the work that Cindy and uh, Carol and um, Karen Long initiated proved that the numbers all of a sudden exploded. Um, so that is definitely a draw. Um, that, that's my two, uh, two cents worth. Well, I, um, we're gonna, we're running a little bit behind, so uh, we're gonna have to move on, but I will, uh, I'm the guy who unfortunately writes the minutes after these meetings, and I'll capture all the ideas that people had with regard to this issue. But in, in addition, I would encourage people to email the steering committee and say, hey, I had this idea or this place, which you didn't think of tonight, but it, it's like, you know, it should be considered because it's, it's in a unique neighborhood. Um, and I'll just give you one idea, one um, perhaps not a great idea, but it's a idea. And I know that in our neighborhoods, we have a lot of these garden parks that are sort of triangle shaped where the roads are, um, have been cut off and there's a little green space. And we could, we could have a potentially uh, a rotating event on, on these things where different months you go to different parks. So um, that's just something that came up to the top of my head. I'm not saying it's a great idea, but it's a idea. And if other people have ideas um, that they didn't get a chance to voice or they, they think of later, please send them. So um, I'm going to move on mm -hmm. or if we're OK. Um, Okay, the next up is the sidewalk study. Maddie, uh, you're up. Yep, uh, I'm actually gonna kick us off. So uh, I'm Laura Wheelock. I'm a senior public works engineer with uh, the department. I've been working with Maddie on our updated sidewalk inventory. Um, she's gonna go through a few slides, kind of the progress that we've made. This is our fourth inventory that the city has done um, since trying to work on assessing our sidewalks. So Patty, whenever you're ready to start sharing, feel free to bring that up. All right, hello everyone. I am um, Maddie Sender, an Associate Public Works Engineer with the City of Burlington. Um, so just to start off, this is our transportation overview of some of our big capital projects over the last couple of years, just pointing out that we've been doing typically three miles of sidewalk work. Also, I've, you can see my screen, right? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, three miles of sidewalk over the past couple of years, um, the past five years, and, and around three miles planned for this year as well. So as Laura mentioned, we just redid our sidewalk inventory. Um, the last inventory was done in 2014. Um, the inventory was done by a consultant. They essentially had this wheeled device that had a bunch of sensors on it. They rolled it over the entire sidewalk network and collected what we call barrier scores. So um, we added a few extra barrier scores, roughness and gap through this effort. Um, and these are just raw condition of the sidewalk. So any heaving, cross slope, running slope, puddling, roughness, or gapping um, was collected through this. 
And then we combine that with the activity score, which I'll go into next and that creates the sidewalk condition index. So this map over here shows the barrier score by block group. So the yellow block groups, their census block groups, they have the highest amount of barriers. So those are the worst sidewalks versus um, the darker colors have better sidewalks over the average of that block group. So that's just kind of a brief snippet into what our network looks like from a high level. So this map shows the barrier scores of the entire network, zero being the best sidewalks and 100 being the worst sidewalks. And then through the middle, you can see what those scores kind of correlate to. Um, and these barrier scores can be things like this here, how this kind of shows a gap between the sidewalks or heaved panel, um, cross slope issues, running slope issues. So many things can give a bad barrier score. I'm so, excuse me, Maddie, but I don't understand the slide. Could you just talk us through it a little bit more? What what does the bar chart at the top mean? Yeah, so this, for instance, here, this shows there is, or maybe here, this shows five miles of a barrier score that's right around 10. So five miles of sidewalk that essentially brand new. Over here, we have sidewalks that might have some minor shoes, like minor cracks, but they're not really lifted, or maybe the cross slope might be a little off, so the panel might be tilted just a bit. So this shows, you know, we have uh, like 20 or maybe more like 50 sidewalk miles of sidewalk in this. It's, you know, five miles here, 20 miles here. So all of these add up. Um, and then over here we have 50 to 75 score, which could be something like their panels are starting to corrode. Um, they might have some lips, some like heaved panels. Um, so this is the mileage in that group. And then over here, these are like the worst of the worst sidewalks. Um, you can see this panel up at the very top of the picture is like totally cracked. Over here, there's a major piece missing. Um, so this is. Over here, I should say these axes show miles in parentheses and then feet. So <coughs> easier kind of to conceptualize the miles. And then this is the actual barrier score along here. Does that does that help verify? It does. So I have just one other question. I, I assume the different bars within each um, uh, category are areas of the city. Is that right? Yeah. So this is. You know, this might be one mile of the city. This is five miles Looks of like the city's sidewalks. Like um, like this bar, this is, you know, a mile of the sidewalks, six miles. Is that? No, I think it's the six miles within a particular region. No, so it's, it's a total of the city's 130 miles of sidewalks broken out into its general condition. So if you were to add up all of these bars, they would add to 130, which is the entire city sidewalk. So, sorry, I'll, let's have a conversation offline because I still don't understand what all the different bars are for. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so moving forward to the activity and equity score, um, this was a major uh, focus of this updated inventory. Um, in red, this shows all of the updated activity producers for equity scores that we included. So we essentially have a map of all of the transit stops, schools, parks, city attractions, which could be anything from um, like a markets to senior centers or community centers or anything like that. And then pedestrian centers kind of goes into that as well. Employment centers, medical. Um, and then we added a downtown district, uh, mobility challenges, which considers age and neurodiverse populations. Um, we added from the census data, um, high minority population, high low income population, and high no vehicle households. So those last three are all provided in block groups. So 
over here, we have a heat map of just like the barrier score map. This just shows the activities score. So by block group, it shows which portions of the city are the most activated based on these criteria. So I unfortunately have another um, similar graphic. So I'm sorry if this is hard to grasp and I've included it twice in two separate ways, but this is essentially mirroring the same map or the same graphic above, but this shows the activity and the barrier combined. So this shows just the curve of how much sidewalk we have in the condition that it's in. So the lowest priority being over here and then highest priority, worst condition sidewalk being over here to give the total sidewalk condition index. So then this graphic is really just helpful to understand an order of magnitude that would fall within an area that we would start developing work plans or target for future funding. It's helpful that it's kind of a smooth curve as you head into this 100 to 150 area. Um, but that's really where you know we still have very minute data that would focus on a work plan to address the sidewalks that are kind of represented at the tail of that graph. So this next graphic is a lot on one page, but it essentially shows the entire framework of this model that we have created. So we first split this up into two things, blocks. So these would be entire block sections of um, sidewalk that are in poor shape and then segments. So segments are smaller sections. It could be two panels that are deteriorated and the rest of the block is fine, or maybe a stretch of like 50 to 100 feet, but the rest of the block is fine. Um, so first we have a three mile annual work plan that we are creating. So we prioritize a half a mile of the worst block sections based on barrier only. So this is half a mile of the worst sections of sidewalk just based on their barrier score. And then we take the next mile and a half of the blocks to create a two mile work plan. And that next mile and a half is the worst barrier scores plus activity score. So that kind of helps us decide if there's two sections of sidewalk that are in identical shape. They're both very poor, but one of them is on the outskirts of town and the other is right downtown next to a school and a grocery store and a senior center. I'm making a theoretical, but that one that's right next to all those pedestrian generators would get bumped on the list, seeing that it's in identical shape as another sidewalk that's not being used as much. So that gives us two miles that we would give to a contractor to do a full block section. Um, so two miles spread throughout the city of various blocks. And then we would move to the segments and we do a mile of segments. So those are just the short runs that we do every year. We again take a half mile of the worst segments just based on, acti or based on barrier scores. So just the worst condition sidewalks. And then we have a half mile of those and then the second half mile that we do for short runs is based on barrier and activity. So for this year, we have roughly a mile and a half planned and out to bid um, as of this week to give to a contractor. Um, and we should be getting bids back by the end of the month. And then we have a mile of short runs that we will do with our own in-house crews. Um, and they will be doing those that mile of short run segments versus the mile and a half, roughly two miles of block segments for a contractor. And then we also have new sidewalks. Which Maddie, I'll go let's, let's just pause for one second. What all this is really trying to say, so we've been with you guys a few times over the years and, and you've asked us, you know, why are you not doing this sidewalk? Why are you not doing that sidewalk? And that was one of the deficiencies with our previous inventory is that it didn't have a way to create these four groups in a way that gave us at DPW a way to see them and really be able to focus on repairing what needs to get repaired. And so this really descriptive uh, slide is our attempt with this new data to be able to do that. 
we're still going to have to test it out. We're still going to need the feedback, and Maddie will get to that. But that's really what this slide is trying to show is all of the feedback that you guys have given us over the last few years is, is put into mostly what's here, organizing this. So the um, second portion of this is the new sidewalk. So that's where there's not existing sidewalk on a street. And um, the next slide goes into how, I, how we prioritize those. So this is a map of all of the sections of sidewalk throughout the city that are missing. Um, so I tried to zoom in to Ward 1 and 8 as well. Um, but we essentially prioritize these based on activity score only. And then we also give consideration to if there's sidewalk on one side of the street already. So if there's no sidewalk on either side of the street, then that gets prioritized higher than a sidewalk that might be on only one, that already a street that might have sidewalk on one side of the street and not the other. Um, so these are funded through state and federal grants. Um, so we have to apply to that. There are no current grants in progress for this summer. So there won't be any new sidewalks constructed this summer. And this again shows the highest priority being in yellow, lowest being in the darker blue. What we are working towards with this effort is um, applying to the CCRPC to help have them help us study the streets that don't have a sidewalk on either side to start doing that scoping, um, working with the community, doing outreach so that as we do look towards applying for grants, you know, we have a much more solid application and this effort and this work product, which we didn't have previously, uh, will really help with that. So for outreach, um, we are in the final stages of development for this tool. Um, and as we do finalize, we will be reaching out um, with any new information. Um, we will allow for some user input um, for some of the activity components and equity scoring. Um, so there will be a public notification to follow and, and um, guidance for how we can seek that input. Um, and then moving forward, we are still going to be using C -click Fix and any other methods um, of contact that people come to us with. Um, and for user-driven requests, we can just kind of see exactly where they fit into this prioritization rank um, and also where things might have fallen through the cracks. Um, and then that's really all I had, just my contact information. I don't know if there's Wait, questions or if Laura wants to add anything. Do we, have, do we have questions in the room here? I have. Jane? Yeah. I, do you want to stop the screen sharing so we can see everybody? Hey, um, thank you so much for that. Um, I have just two logistical questions. One for the first category of a mile and a half that's out for the contract. Do you, um, do you have like a timeline on that? Um, like what, what that looks like? Um, and then... The second question is, if we're adding more sidewalks, this might just be a really general question. You might not know the answer, or you do. Or, um, but like, if we're adding more sidewalk mileage, are we going to up the yearly sidewalk repair to like four years eventually? Or I mean, sorry, four miles or something like that eventually? Like, how does that work? Um, <laughs> those are great questions. So to speak to the first one, the um, we put the bid out right after the bond came through for the approval. Um, so thank everybody for that. It's greatly appreciated. The bond approval does speak to fiscal year 23. And so while we are getting contractor pricing now, the work wouldn't start be able to start until July 1. We do still have our own crews that are out working and their fiscal year budget through 22 um, is still active. So there's not a total gap in sidewalk work, but certainly a lot more starting July 1. As it relates to visiting the overall maintenance budget, as we do add mileage, we will need to revisit that maintenance schedule. At the moment, sidewalk work is really only accomplished at this level by going to bonds for the voters. We've had conversations internally at our capital committees how we need to find a more sustainable way to fund our sidewalk infrastructure. Hopefully we'll figure that out in three years. Thank you. Cindy? Yeah, th thanks, Tom. Um, so 
I think I missed this, Madeline. Uh, maybe you included it in the presentation. I, I missed it, but um, I think a lot of people in this room are interested in, in what specifically will be happening in terms of sidewalks in wards one and eight. I think one, wards one and eight are some of the areas that have some of the worst sidewalks in town because they're so old and um, for a bunch of other reasons in terms of hydrology and stuff. So if, if you could help us with that either now or after this meeting, it would be great if we knew specifically what we can expect in terms of, uh, of improvements to uh, the sidewalks in wards one and eight this year, that would be, and, and, and next year if you if planned that far ahead. Yeah, so, I wanna start with this. I wanna, I wanna remind everybody, we still do have our construction portal, construction portal up and running on the city's uh, website, and that will list out any of our you know, tentative work plans for this year. Major capital work that's included in Ward 1 and 8 this year is Mansfield Ave's side path replacement. So that's that asphalt path on the east side of the road. That's been out to bid. It goes to the city council um, on the 21st for award of a construction contract. University Place is has um, expansion sidewalk and also uh, widening of sidewalk in that area. That goes uh, probably to the city council in April. Um, Maddie, there's also a few other locations, larger locations, right, inside of one and eight that we had. Prospect Hill is being done through the, or that was put out to bid. Oh, okay. all right, the lights timed out. Um, Prospect Hill was included in our contract, um, and also Hungerford Terrace, which isn't quite in Ward One Eight, but is right on the border. Um, those are the only two that were in the sidewalk contract that was put out to bid already. The short run list of all the segments um, has yet to be finalized. So as that is created, um, as Laura said, that will be published to the construction portal, which is updated pretty much daily during the construction season. So you can see when things are planned, when they're done. Um, and you'll also get notifications um, at, throughout the season as work is in your neighborhood. So one more quick question and then I'll shut up. But um, there are a lot of dangerous sidewalk conditions in wards one and eight. And um, a number of people in this room, either literally or figuratively, have, you know, have had serious injuries from, from tripping up on sidewalks. So I'm, hope, I'm wondering and hoping that the DPW segment um, um, section of the work will address some of those fairly significant trip and fall hazards because there, there are a bunch of them out there and people in this uh, you know in this meeting have been walking with me and, and have tripped a number of times and, and you know gotten hurt and so I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you can address um, you not you specifically I don't, don't mean to target you I'm sorry Madeline and I, I really am not a harsh person but I just I really would like for for this program to focus on the most egregious issues. And there's some serious trip and fall problems out there that, um, that could be addressed more strategically and not through the through the big, I forget what you call the, um, not the block program, but the segment program. Is there any chance for that? And yeah. I'm gonna stop. <laughs> no, certainly. Um, I mean, we are prioritizing every sidewalk throughout the entire city. So Ward 1 and 8, has been prioritized in this. There are sections that came up um, through this segment prioritization um, that we will plan to get to. Um, and I, I know over the past couple of years, um, I have received a lot of input uh, for the Ward 1 and 8 sidewalks. Um, and I know we have uh, addressed a number of them um, and there's always more, but we do I do hear your concerns. I, I get the calls and I, I get the emails and I do read them. I do go out there and look at the sidewalk and um, I'm in constant communication with our right-of-way crews that are, are doing the work. So we are always trying to prioritize the, the worst of the worst and that includes those that fall into the Ward 1 and 8. Hey, Madeline and Laura, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna have to move on. Um... So thanks for giving us the update, showing us your metrics and, and how you determine what sidewalks are going to get uh, repairs. And that brings us to the Barge Canal 
um, conservation. Andrew? Uh, Unmuting. Hi, um, I'm Andy Simon. Um, hello to my friend. Oh, oh. You're, on, you're, on, you're on mute. You're on mute. I'm unmuting. There you are. There you are. I, I keep I keep unmuting and I keep not being unmuted. Hi, I'm Andy Simon. Um, I uh, live in Ward Five on Locust Street, and um, I just wanted to say hi to my friends in Ward One and Eight who are here tonight or listening in. Um, I am here with Ruby Perry, my partner, and. Um, uh, we are part of a group called Save Open Space Burlington, and right now we are focusing on conservation and remediation of the Pine Street Barge Canal. Um, we think there are, we really appreciate you giving us space in your agenda, and we think there are many reasons why um, the, the fate of the Barge Canal um, is, is or should be a concern for the whole city and not just the South End. Um, we would like to do a short presentation um, and uh, should be about nine minutes total and then uh, we'll have time for a question and answer. And we really would love to have um, some uh, participation questions. So I need to get to... Hmm. No, it's not letting me do that. You can't share? You can't share. Um, I can share, but all I get is I'm not getting my, let's see. Okay. You got that? We are not we are seeing not your share. share. Okay. You see it? No. 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 You're not seeing it. Hmm. Okay. Could be that I got in on, um, I had trouble getting in and I, so I did it through my browser. Is that gonna cause problems? Maybe. Ruby, maybe you could share it. You have to register as a participant to share. I don't know if that's helpful. I am a, a panelist, is that what you mean? A panelist, yeah, that's what I meant, sorry. I, I am a panelist. Um, and, uh, but I wonder if it's just because I am um, we're seeing something now. now. Here, there, there we go. There, you go. there we go. Okay. Let's see if I can get back on there. Are you seeing that? We see your share. Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So I just need to grab a power cord. Ruby, if you could give me a power cord, that would be great. Okay. I just need to get to slideshow, which is not giving me. Oh, is this your screen, Ruby? Okay. Sorry about this. Are you guys, Are you guys ready? ready? Yep, yep. Sorry about that. I ran out of power, so I just needed to get back on. So um, this is just a general map of where the Pine Street Barge Canal is. We assume a lot of you know where it is. But just to sort of be uh, uh, together on where, where uh, we are, this is, um, you see where it says site. It's um, west of Pine Street, just north of uh, Burlington Electric. And um, you may have seen it from the bike path. Let's go to the next one, Luke. Good to have a bit of historical context for, um, for this sort of complex piece of land. This is um, before the, ninth, the middle of the 19th century, this was all wetlands. So we're looking at the Barge Canal pre-1850. Um, and uh, it's a transitional zone between the growing city and Lake Champlain. It was a fishing, hunting, hunting and gathering place for 
indigenous people and for early Euro-American residents. Next, please. So this is the first major ecological change that happened to the, uh, to the barge canal. It was the completion of the Rutland and Burlington Railroad uh, in 1849. And if you look at this next map, you can see um, the, this time the, the map is turned sideways and you can see the lake uh, at the top of the map and a railroad that goes right across the, um, uh, between the lake and the barge canal land. We'll come back to this slide because it's got some interesting features. Um, in, um, in the lumber industry then came in in the second half of the 19th century and um, Vermont's once Vermont's forests were uh, depleted by the, by the lumbering that was going on, most of the lumber started coming in from Quebec, down the lake on barges. Um, as the industry grew, the wetlands were filled in with sawdust and wood chips. And to keep the mills going through the winter because the barges were coming in on the lake, uh, they had to have more storage space. And to that end, uh, Lawrence Barnes, who was one of the big uh, lumber barons in Burlington, uh, had a canal excavated right there uh, where we call the Barge Canal now, uh, and into the filled wetlands, made a drawbridge across the railroad that you can sort of see there, um, and solved at least momentarily the lumber storage problem. Then um, the lumber industry declined in the end of the um, 19th century. And another enterprise took its place at the Barge Canal. This is a manufactured gas plant. Um, manufactured gas plants uh, run on, pen ran at that time on coal from Pennsylvania that was shipped up on barges and on the railroad. Um, the Burlington Gaslight Company uh, manufactured gas from coal uh, and supplied houses and businesses in Burlington for 60 years, from essentially 1900 till it was closed in 1966. Next slide, please. Um, manufacturing gas from coal was a dirty business. And the coal tar saturated wood chips and other waste products were essentially just dumped out back, um, out in back of the manufactured gas plant on Pine Street. This is a, an image of that. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, with the growing environmental consciousness, the newly created EPA took control of the Barge Canal as a federal Superfund site. They identified 56 contaminants of concern in the soil and water, including various hydrocarbons and heavy metals. In 1998, after a long and fruitful but sometimes contentious process, the EPA issued its record of decision on the Barge Canal it was decided to cap the coal tar at the bottom of the canal of the water and essentially leave the land alone with reviews every five years and regular uh, monitoring of soil and groundwater contaminants. Next, please. So we're back to this slide and here's the situation now. Trees and other plants have grown back. Some natives like cottonwood and red osier dogwood, others considered invasive like buckthorn and phragmites um, beavers, herons, ducks, geese populate the wetlands. The major contaminants in the undisturbed land have, according to the EPA, remained largely stationary. Next, please. This is the current zoning map of the Barge Canal, again, turned in the other orientation uh, with the lake to the, to the left. Um, you can see that the area um, uh, in the green line, inside the green line, is zoned for uh, conservation. So all of that land is conservation land, uh, according to city zoning. Um, if you could go back just one more, Rube, quickly. Um, the yellow line on this map is the Superfund boundary. So the federal Superfund site is delineated by the um, yellow, the yellow line. Um, the, um, the, some of this land in the conservation zone is private land, and some of the center land, the center area, is public, publicly owned, city-owned city land. There are two um, parcels right on Pine Street 453 and 501 
that are private land and are currently for sale. Okay, Rube, you're on. So am I unmuted? We can yeah. hear you, hear you. Okay, so here's where we started our campaign to conserve and remediate the Barge Canal. On a cold day in mid-November 2021, we gathered with friends and neighbors to consider how much the Barge Canal had done to heal itself and protect the lake. With debris from the land, late flowers and herbs from our gardens and paintings of mushrooms and birds, we created this collective offering of our gratitude. On that day, in a very real way, we committed ourselves to caring for this land. There are many, many reasons to conserve and care for the Barge Canal site. So we'll take a short drone tour of the area while we discuss them. The most obvious benefit to Burlington is a healthy functioning wetlands habitat in the middle of the South End, home to mammals, birds, insects, plants, fungi, and microbes. The Living Barge Canal protects the lake by providing flood control for the South End and helps the city manage its stormwater runoff. It stabilizes the soil, containing and slowly transforming the toxins left over from industry. The Living Barge Canal sequesters carbon, creates climate resilience, and nature-based solutions to climate disruption. The Barge Canal also has the potential to remind us of our history, indigenous, natural, and industrial history. At this point, the city of Burlington owns 11 acres. Oh. At this point, the city of Burlington owns 11 acres in the center of the Barge Canal land. And that was purchased decades ago in preparation for the construction of the Southern Connector Highway. The rest is privately held. The small private parcels along the railroad track are wetlands and are already zoned for conservation. This is where our regeneration work needs to be started immediately. We can begin this spring to care for the land. There, there is extensive debris from de decades of neglect at the Barge Canal. Starting in April, there will be a volunteer effort to inventory the plants and animals on the public land. Non-native buckthorn has taken over large parts of the site along the canal and native polycultures need to be planted and nurtured. We're envisioning the site as a forested parkland, perhaps a botanical garden of diverse native species. We imagine the Barge Canal as a center for education with interpretive pathways to learn about our natural history, indigenous presence on the land, as well as the obvious industrial history embodied there. We imagine it as a research and training ground for scientists, a living laboratory for much needed cold climate bioremediation research. A UVM class in plant and soil science has already designed their semester's project there. A wildlands park could offer safe public access with boardwalks and a possible route through the bike path. Ideally, we see the land already under conservation expanding to include the private land at the Barge Canal. We're exploring the idea of rematriation of the land opening to its original inhabitants for ritual and traditional uses by entering into partnership with our Abenaki neighbors. So we've been active these last months, these last few months. Our main strategy has been to learn as much as we can about the Barge Canal and to get as many people aware and involved as possible. So we've talked, we began with talking with indigenous elders and leaders in terms of really how to read the land. We launched the petition and that, that'll come up momentarily and we can, that'll be in your notes. We've talked with all the city boards and commissions. We've provided information to city council. We've, dis we've had discussions with CEDO, with EPA, with the Vermont DEC. We've had discussions with land trusts. We've engaged with private landowners, worked with UVM students and teachers made contact with Vermont environmental groups, held pop-up events on Pine Street, talked to the South End residents and leaders, presented at NPAs. 
you can help. Your voice is essential to conserving and remediating this land. Now is the time to get involved, to develop your own relationship with the Barge Canal. Visit the Barge Canal, write your city councilor, speak at public input sessions at South End Rezoning, uh, on South End Rezoning, talk to neighbors and friends, show up for pop-up events like this one, participate in citizen science projects, sign the petition. We send regular updates out to petition signers. We have a Facebook page and a nascent website, and we need help with all aspects of the campaign. The city of Burlington needs to be a partner in this effort to help with the active regeneration of the land, including cleaning it up, as well as restoring and protecting the natural ecosystem. In order for this to happen, the city government needs to hear from Burlington residents that they care about the Barge Canal. We will ask that these links be included in the minutes of this, of this meeting, or you can contact us directly by email, and we will send you all the links. We see this brown field transitioning with our care into a green field. Our vision for conserving the Barge Canal land is a paradigm shift, a different way of thinking about development and open land and about our responsibility to clean up after ourselves, a different way of thinking about our relationship to our home. We'll leave you with a poem by Judy Dow and a Benakeith elder and educator. Gypsies and pirates were derogatory terms used by some people in Burlington for Abenakis and French Canadians. The Canal Barge, a little inlet where one goes to seek refuge, home to the ancient ones, big and small. Gypsies sell their ash baskets to those going by while pirates dock their barges for a temporary home. Lumber stored in piles mountains high brought flames, red hot and smoky tones of gray throughout the sky. A cemetery for three barges wide and long, skeletons from a time long ago sit side by side with a schooner, while bare bones of others sink deep in the mud, their silhouettes outlined in the archeological reports. The basin dredged and filled over and over again, protected by breakwaters today, the canal stands calm. Sealed shut until 1961, an opening was made for barges to once again enter where they sat abandoned. Along came the Burlington Gaslight Company, the beautiful wetlands filled to their top with coal tar. Years of abuse left behind a huge Superfund site. The wetlands plants fight to survive, hanging in there for another day, but they can't do it alone. We need our help. Our feet have led us there and back many times, leaving only footprints behind. We've watched nature struggle along the canal for far too long. Those that have benefited from this land need to remember now. That's by Judy Dow. Well, guys, thanks for that presentation. Um, do, do we have uh, questions here in the room? Or on uh, from Zoom, Kathy. Is there some plans to build on that land, or are you getting any pushback from the city that they don't want this? Well, there, those are two questions. Um, the reason we started this campaign last fall was because there's a for sale sign on those front uh, those front parcels and they are for sale and in terms of the city we have gotten no support from the city they have no interest um the message from the mayor is that he wants to redevelop that land what would he it's wetlands what would he redevelop it as um the kathy the 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 redevelopment land is essentially those two parcels in the front um the 453 and 501 Pine Street that are private. And there have been several, um, over the years, there have been several different projects that have been proposed for it, but it's always been um, unfeasible uh, for mostly for a financial uh, reason because there's so many different restrictions on that land. Now there are um, more uh, funds that are available for, for brownfield remediation. so there's sort of um, closing that gap between what um, what's proposed and what's possible. 
and there seems to be uh, someone who is interested in buying it, though we don't know exactly what who that is or what that project is. It is not, according to uh, Rick Davis, who owns the land, or um, uh, Scott Mapes, who works with him, it's not housing. It's not a residential development. Um, but um, there are um, there are interested buyers. The rest of it, as you say, is wetlands. But the wetlands also need city support in terms of uh, uh, remediation, the remediation that happens there. There's so much that needs to happen, starting with cleanup, then um, thinking about what plants uh, should be removed, what plants should be planted, um, and um, learning about what kinds of bioremediation strategies would work there to actually address the, the pollution on that land. Okay, uh, Andy, uh, are you, you, did you send us a copy of your presentation and the, the links that, that you described? I didn't, but I will tonight. Okay. Um, send it to, should I send it to, to you, Jonathan, or Tom? Send it to Tom. Okay. And, I'll, and we'll be uh, putting a link, uh, the, the city will post it on the NPA site, and then uh, we'll put a link to that site in the minutes. Great. And people who want to contact us directly, it's just sosburlington at gmail.com. That sounds good. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry about the... Um, Thank you very much. ...at the beginning. Okay, uh, the, the, we're, uh, we're sort of pressed for time, so we're going to skip the, the Locavor coupon handout, and we're going to just uh, close the meeting with the Great Streets discussion. Uh, Olivia, are you on? Olivia and I are uh, going to give the presentation together. I actually... Uh, down our slides a little bit just uh, knowing that we are a little tight for time there is a full presentation would you, available would you, on the great streets website for some of this material um but Laura, really this Laura, is just you, a, you to come back come next month, next month? <laughs> um maybe next month um uh, maybe in may as well um but I do want to just kind of, there is some information in here for people who are still here um and that we can give you quickly right now Okay. So the city, is, uh, especially with the vote, so we appreciate the, the positive voter feedback, um, has the opportunity to redevelop our main street from Battery Street to Union Street. Um, this is more substantial than even St. Paul Street was. This has the opportunity to do all of our utilities, water, sewer, separated stormwater, um, and then as well as the surface features, lighting, bicycle facilities, wider pedestrian facilities, um, a lot of different functional features, as well as the other things that really can make a street great. We wanna think about establishing our safe connections, uh, providing transit opportunities, really being able to manage stormwater within the corridor. Uh, Main Street has a, a lot of impervious surface and a lot of impervious surface that feeds into it. So we wanna take that opportunity to really do something great with the street. Um, these are the kinds of things that the city and our design team have. But we also want to make sure that you know we take a look at who's using the street and you know really make sure that the pedestrians that are there cyclists other residents vehicles drivers property owners have the opportunity and know how to get in touch with this project team to be able to provide your feedback uh, this image was done from our previous effort so it's really just kind of a to spark conversation it speaks to some of those wider dedicated facilities you also see the tree belt um, that has a lot of infrastructure underground to be able to support healthy trees, but it speaks to reestablishing a tree canopy along Main Street that can thrive. There are rain garden facilities, um, new lighting, and new pause places that we want to be able to develop. And these are some of the, um, the elements, the pause places, the activation, the local activation, maybe something that supports adjacent uh, uses on the street that we really need our community to provide us feedback on as we work to develop this concept. Um, the project would take the diagonal parking. It's our pitch and our proposal, um, but it's not guaranteed until the city council acts on it. 
but we're proposing to take the diagonal square parking spaces, convert them into parallel parking. So they're still parking along and throughout the corridor, but really take that space and rebalance the way that Main Street operates and offers to people. So the consultants kind of look at um, the, the street in three significant categories. Um, the functional elements, which you know hit home to DPW, the utilities that are underground, what the roadway is made out of, what the sidewalk area looks like, but then also the kind of the flexible and unique and beautiful spaces where the, the trees exist, the furnishing, the signage, the, the elements that are going to make Main Street be unique um, from other streets within the city, but also maybe even within its own blocks, because there's a lot of different character that exists along Main Street. We also want to make sure that there is community influence um, throughout the corridor and that there are spaces that can continue to be activated in different ways and be flexible for that. So some of the stuff that I cut out tonight really goes over the outreach that we've done to date, um, but we've been to a lot of NPAs, we've been to a lot of other city structured meetings, we've held a neighborhood meeting. Um, we also have focus groups that sp speak to some of the groups that don't necessarily attend these structured meetings. So we've met with youth groups. We have a meeting um, with a mobility focused group. We just also met with immigrant, an immigrant and refugee group. Um, we've spoken to the businesses several times and we'll continue to do so throughout the course of this project. And then we also have a uh, BIPOC focused meeting that happens uh, later next week. So all of that is trying to take in input, trying to grab all of our residents, grab anybody who's interested and uh, have them get in touch with us, have them communicating with us so that we can really hear the feedback and get that into these concepts that we plan to come back to the public with in late April um, and into the city council and whatnot into May. So we're just really trying to um, get the information out there. You can see on the screen is contact information for Olivia Doris. She is one of our project managers. I am one of the other project managers, um, but that's her email. The Great Streets BTV website is at the bottom. So I'm leaving this up here for a little bit as I talk about our schedule, but those are the, the primary contact points if you wanna find more information about this or find out how to, how to get in touch with us. So what happens after May? Um, ideally, we find a concept that we can kind of come to a good understanding um, compromise of what's going to be out there. Our design consultant will continue our outreach and working with the community um, from May through next summer as we work on refining the designs, the specific elements that are going to go into that, and then targeted a start of construction in the fall of 2023. This will take a minimum of two years and there's some elements that we'll discover throughout the design that may have you know, a block take uh, a little extra time or maybe won't start quite at the fall of 2023 mark. But that's also part of the things we're gonna keep the community informed of. Um, Main Street is is this entire community's Main Street. It's just because it's located in the downtown or you know, in, in words, Word 3, um, doesn't mean that it doesn't mean any less to the entire community. So with that, I'll leave you maybe with a thought provoking question that you can reach out to us um, that we've we've kind of provoked in some of our other focus groups is, do you or people in your community visit Main Street? Why or why not? Um, and if why not, you know, what, what could make it better and what could make it so that people really want to be on Main Street? That's my super fast pitch. Um, I appreciate the, the time that you guys gave us tonight. I know it's definitely tough with some of these uh, got lots to go on, so. Okay, uh, question, is it time for a couple? No, not in the room. Anyone on, on Zoom have a question? I actually do have a question. I guess I'm just curious the number of like parking spaces that there are now versus like when that diagonal parking is converted to parallel parking. Um, we don't know the exact numbers right now. I mean, I, I could try to remember how many, about how many spaces are out there, but it's certainly something that we're looking at. Our consultant said that they should have us information by mid April, our first kind of probably public information on that will come out at the DPW commission. They're the ones who do regulate on street parking. It's a presentation to them there. It's not an action to them. 
Um, but the design and the feedback that we get from the community really will dictate how many spaces that we take. Do we take an extra space to make more rain garden facilities or a larger pause place? Um, or do we keep and retain as many parking spaces as we can because there is a balance that is being lost. Um, but there's not an exact number, unfortunately, right now um, as to what that is. Laura, I've got a quick question for you. You know, when I looked at your the slide of the layout, I didn't see any moving sidewalks that people can get to place to place on, um, which presumably would be electric, which Jack would really like. Or um, and I didn't see cut out, cutouts for buses, which also would be electric. Yep, um, moving sidewalks in our climate is challenging, but we can certainly uh, explore that option. It, it, uh, it, it, it might help with our mobility. Love it. Love it. Um, but the the transit facilities, most of the conversation we have had with GMT is that they do like to be curbside and stay in lane. Um, and so these bump outs would really provide a larger landing area for buses to still stay in their lane um, and kind of facilitate pick up and drop offs. So we've had a preliminary conversation with GMT, certainly more to be done, um, but this should provide enhanced stop locations so that that's better uh, facilitated. Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I, I apologize for the short time. Um, as you can see, our, our schedule is jam-packed. Yep, no, we, we appreciate just being able to let you guys know that we're here. And then, you know, the one-on-one -on -one conversations are also great. And uh, do we have a copy of your presentation? You don't. I'll send you the super short snippet, but I think probably put you, uh, providing the website where there's a lot more content is, is going to be helpful, too. So you're going to send me the short one plus a link to? Okay. And my email is on the NPA site that the city has. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're done. <laughs> done. We're done. Thank, Thank you all for attending. Thank you. <laughs> we will uh, we will look forward to talking to you next time. Okay, sorry.